Hello and welcome to today's webinar hosted by PlanMecca. I'm Brent Garvin, Senior Product Manager for Imaging for PlanMecca USA. And we are very excited to have you here today to talk about uh, this conversation um, with Awaken to Sleep and um, um, in, the, in the whole uh, OSA uh, sleep um, conversation that we have scheduled for you today. I just want to go over a couple housekeeping uh, items before we actually get started with the, uh, the, the lecture. As far as disclosures uh, with the speaker, uh, the speaker has some sort of uh, minor compensation for being here for his time today. As far as questions and answers and our chat function at the bottom of your screen, you will notice that there is a Q&A section um, if you have any questions during the lecture, feel free to post your questions there. We will answer them as we go along. And then some of them we will save towards the end so that our guest can answer those questions live for you. Let's reserve the chat section of the, um, of the uh, interface so that you can enter anything technical related. Um, at this time, you should have uh, a screen on the, on the screen and maybe see chat up in the corner. Other than that, um, we should be good to go. And as far as CEs for this uh, one hour lecture, they will be provided at the end of the course. Um, we will post a link that will take you to uh, the portion where you can fill out your information and uh, receive your CE. And you'll also receive a course code um, in that link as well. And then as far as any future webinars, um, please visit planmecca.com, that's P-L-A-N-M-E-C-A.com. And uh, please register there for any upcoming webinars that we have on this topic or any other topics in the future. And so at this point, I would like to turn it over to Chad Wooders. He is an executive sleep coach for Awaken to Sleep. And he has some exciting information that he wants to share with you. Um, in the world of sleep screening for the OSA patient in the dental practice. Welcome, Chad. Thanks, Brent. Good morning, everyone. Um, if, if it's morning in your area, it's morning here in Southern California. And actually, just to get started, we're gonna we're gonna start off a little bit different. This is this is a fun training. We are um, we're gonna we're gonna hopefully just get you keep to stay awake and and actually get you to make some money in your practice uh, if you're open or when you're going to open. Um, so real quick, some ground rules. One, there is no sleeping and sleep training. It is just the often, too often unspoken rule. It is not unspoken here. Don't fall asleep. If you're in a live course and you fall asleep, I would literally throw a marker at you. So don't do that. Be attentive. Be awake. We're going to go through a lot of information today. Um, and we're going to really try and make sure that you're engaged. Real quick, show of hands. If you guys don't remember how to do it, there's a raise hand button on your Zoom webinar. Show of hands. Who was here last week? on our introduction to sleep apnea and the scope of practice of dentists. Awesome, okay, thank you for returning. Glad to see you guys are here. Um, we are gonna have a small amount of review, but today's focus is really gonna be on how we do what we're here to learn. How do we screen for patients and how do we get them to say yes to a test? So um, real quick, as you guys can see, Right here is a picture of my beautiful fiance and then me, and we just want comments on my aesthetics. And I want to tell you about our first date. See, it was a, a cold December night, and I had kind of taken a break from dating. My career had been really the focus point. I was traveling all the time. I mean, right when I met her, actually, I had traveled for seven weeks straight. I mean, it was just crazy. And um, I finally, a, couple, a month or so after we met, I finally got the courage to ask her on a date. And it was like, it was perfect. I was a proper gentleman, she tells me. I planned the date an hour away from me, 15 minutes away from her, right? So drove all the way out to see her, got there early, left work early to make sure I could get there on time, got her tables. My plan was she was supposed to walk in and we were not supposed to wait longer than two minutes. So that it was just perfectly done. Did all this, I'm at the restaurant early, I'm sitting down. I'm nervous. It's been a little while, right? Uh, who remembers being on the first day? Raise your hand. Um, I was freaking out. Then I get the text. Hey, something happened. Whew, okay, I just drove an hour. 
she could have canceled earlier. I'm kind of like, oh, no, what's going to happen here? I, I don't want to get canceled on. That sucks, right? So I'm like freaking out. What's going on? Um, I'm like, hey, okay, well, um, you're not far. I can pick you up. But, I, I mean, what's, what's going on? She's like, I've got a flat tire. I'm like, shoot, as far as excuses go, that's pretty good. Um, okay, well, I, I, can fix, I can fix a flat tire. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a handy guy. I can, I can help out. If that's not, you know, weird, you know, whatever, I can come fix this tire. And she's like, okay, well, I guess so. So she sends me her location. I drive, she was literally around the corner, like half a mile. I was like, okay, cool. She wasn't canceling. I get there. I pull up, up next to her. I jump into the passenger side of her seat of her car and her mom is on the phone. And I can hear her phone's really loud at the time, right? So she's on the phone and I hear her mom say, hey, make sure that your friends get there first because we don't know if this guy's a creeper. I'm sitting in the passenger side seat, and I'm like, hey. So I'm not a creeper, found out, worked out great. She realized that I could hear her, though, because it was pretty loud, because I think she, my face was like, so she uh, turned down the volume. Apparently, the next thing her mom said was, well, I guess let's see what this guy's really made of. Anyways, we backed the car up. She was driving this little Kia Spectra thing, and oh, my gosh, like, I'm not a big guy, as you can tell, but I am not a small man either. I had to like lay on my belly and I couldn't fit more than one shoulder. And when you're changing a tire, even with the car, it was just, it was an adventure. Um, come to find out, back her car up into this little driveway place. And we actually end up uh, finding everything we need in the back of her car to change this tire. Everything, the jack, the spare tire, um, the tire wrench, everything was, was just right there, ready for us to use. And we ended up fixing this tire. Um, her friends ended up getting there a couple minutes later and hanging out with us. They ended up taking her car. I drove us to dinner, and that was, um, oh, man, almost two, a year and a half ago uh, now. And we're getting married in August for, on August 1st. So, um, yeah, it was an amazing first date. It turned into from one dinner to, like, six hours of talking Christmas lights and all this crazy stuff. And, and as, you, as, as you can See, I, I obviously fell hard. So why do I tell you this story? Dentist, dental clinician, dental teammates, you're a lot like my Jenna. You actually, actually have everything you need already with you to screen patients for sleep apnea. You just need to be showed how to use the tools. So today, we're going to share with you a lot of information. Uh, and we're going to get into some clinical stuff. I'm going to show you guys how to talk to patients about these clinical things. But we're really going to share with you things that you probably are familiar with. We're going to talk about screening from the mouth out and integrating a workflow starting with hygiene. And these are not integral signs that you're unfamiliar with. You're going to notice them. And we're going to show you how they apply to sleep and how to use them to get people to say yes to a test. So um, real quick, please make sure your hands are down so we can have more participation in just a few seconds. And let's get started. Now, some of you guys, this is your first time, and um, we're going to not go into a huge background of me because a lot of you guys are already here from last time. So please, if you guys want a, a background of me, go to Plan Mecca's recordings. They've got a bunch of recordings for you. Or check out Awaken to Sleep Education on YouTube. We've got a couple versions of my story on there, one or two, and you can learn more about my story and why sleep apnea is important to me. Um, one thing as relates to just the screening conversation, um, one, the, this is another picture of Jenna, same photo shoot, different picture. And Jenna was someone who's chronically tired. She was a professional cheerleader in college and won nationals and stuff all over the world, uh, country and all this stuff. Crazy, super athletic person, um, really smart, but she was always tired and she's not a cheerleader anymore. She was like, oh my gosh, what happened? Like, why, where's my energy? Well, after time, I finally got her to get diagnosed. Oh, sorry, get her to get a test. Um, and actually, since that time, it was really funny. We actually got her mom and her dad tested and her tested. And um, we're still waiting on some results, but I believe most of them are diagnosed with sleep apnea so far. And that's, it, that's amazing. It, my in-laws' are, lives are changed because of awareness because I know these signs and things we're going to talk about. For me, some of you guys have heard this story. I'm just going to give you the short version. But... I'm not your stereotypical apneic. Um, at the time of the picture that you're seeing is taken, I was about a buck 40. I've gained some weight now, and that's intentional. But I'm not, I'm 5'11, I'm in pretty decent shape. Um, 
I'm not your stereotypical ethnic. I'm just another guy who actually got missed. And the reality is that when I worked in dental practices, I had dentists and practice managers telling me, Chad, you don't need to worry about it. Look at you. And, and I believed them. I thought that looking at myself in the mirror was a criteria for screening. We're, going to we're, not, we're not going to talk about looking yourself in the mirror as a criteria for screening today, but I will tell you this. I was diagnosed as a moderate apneic because Awaken to Sleep's protocol is that all personnel must try all home sleep studies. So we get to try a lot of home sleep studies, which is really neat. But when I finally figured out how to do it right, not like I did in this picture, upside down and backwards, I actually got diagnosed as a moderate apneic. If you were here last week, you know that I stopped breathing between 15 and 30 times an hour. Statistically, I would have lost a decade of my life as a moderate apneic if I had gone undiagnosed. Today, um, I am treated for my apnea. I had a tonsillectomy, and I have a couple oral appliances, and, um, and my life has changed. I... I used to joke about kids, right? And you, you see the kids and you're like, okay, if I could just bottle up that energy, like the energy that kid has in an hour, if I could bottle that up and, and just, you know, take it, take some, I would be good for the rest of the day or maybe just, you know, be able to sell it and make lots of money, whatever. But, but the reality is when I got treated for my apnea, I actually stopped asking that question. I didn't even realize it for like six months. My energy, my my interactions with people, the way I wake up in the, I actually woke up in the morning. And that was a big indicator for me that something was different. So when we talk about screening guys, it's, it's really important to me. And that's why this protocol, this script we're going to talk about today. It, I, I really want you guys to pay attention. I really want you guys to take notes. And here's the reality of it. You not taking notes is only going to hurt your patients. And you're here because you want to help your patients. So take notes, be attentive, ask questions, participate. Please, if you don't participate, if you were here last week, you'll know I'm going to call you out to, to make sure to participate. Okay, so let's get started. One, we talked about this a little bit last week, and I just want to kind of put it as an overview so we can remember what we're talking about. As it relates to the process of treating patients with apnea, there's three steps. One, we have to identify those who are at risk. Identify those who are at risk. The second part is we have to assess the presence and severity of the condition. So we need to have a work with a physician to diagnose home sleep studies and or in lab studies to figure out if our patients have a medical condition or a cosmetic problem. And then based on their clinical severity of diagnosis, we're gonna treat those patients if it falls within our scope as a dentist. Today, what we're gonna talk about specifically and spend a lot of time on, not like last week where we did an overview, is we're gonna talk about identifying those who are at risk, screening on a team level and take, having a systematic approach. So what, is it, what does it mean to screen on a team level? Very simply, what I'm going to talk about, we're mostly going to pull on hygiene and doctor, but front office and dental assistants, you guys have a role to play here too. Dental assistants, um, if you're on this call, then you're going to follow a similar protocol to what we're going to talk about with hygienists. So if you're on this call, just know you have a role. Real quick, um, I asked everyone to bring their teams on the call, so I'm going to do a quick roll call. Um, who here is a dental assistant? Raise your hands. Okay, awesome. Um, who here, go ahead and put your hands down. Who here is a front office person? Go ahead and raise your hands. Okay, a couple of you guys, awesome. Can I have a couple doctors raise your hand? I'm sure we've got a lot of those on the call today. There we go, awesome. Doctors, I'm glad you're on this call. Um, you are going to be the driving force for this a lot of the time, but I want to also encourage you, take notes of this. Go look, go watch this recording that Plan Mecca does for you with your team later. And don't worry about rewatching it because I've had offices that we've taught this to two or three times live, and they always get better at it. So don't worry about that. Um, okay, so uh, front office, the first thing that you're going to have a role in, your job in the process is we're gonna make sure to have the proper screening forms and be looking at medical history for these patients. So we, we sent you guys two screening forms last week. I hope you filled those out. We're gonna come back to those in just a few minutes here as we approach our script. But here, medical history, what we're talking about, this information that's gathered at the front office, I wanna show your, bring your attention to four large ones. One, at the very second and bottom is all hypertension. No, sorry, paraphrase. This study shows the prevalence of sleep apnea with other medical conditions. We're not talking about causal relationships here. So all hypertension, 
37% of people who had hypertension also had obstructive sleep apnea. Jump up a little bit, I want to talk about type 2 diabetes. 72% of patients with type 2 diabetes also had obstructive sleep apnea. Going up just a little bit, 77% of patients with obesity also had obstructive sleep apnea. And the last one is 83% of patients who take two or more medications for their high blood pressure also had obstructive sleep apnea. When we look at this, real quick, show of hands, if you're someone on this call and you have um, a couple patients that you see on a day-to-day -day basis that have these comorbidities, one or two of them, raise your hand. Who has one or two patients that just came to mind just based on this one piece? All right, that is it for our entire training. I'll see you later. Just kidding. No, this is already, we had over 30 people just raise their hands right now. That's amazing. Um, Gary, I'm sorry you didn't get the screening forms. Um, I'll try and see if our team can send you those. If you, they'll message you privately, and um, if you can send them their email, we'll see if we can get those sent to you. Um, otherwise, at the end of our call today, we'll make sure those are sent to you as well. So here, when we are talking about screening patients, it starts with, with just our normal documentation. You already have the tools. Now, you can modify your medical history and stuff so that you have the right questions and you can be looking for these things. But front office, what I want you to do if you're on this call is I want you to put a little O or maybe an OSA or a star on the corner of a route sheet so that whoever you're handing the patient off to knows that there's a risk of an airway disorder. That's gonna be your role. If you notice medical history, some offices make all patients fill out the screening forms. That totally works, we recommend that. If you're not like that office, maybe you're gonna make sure to validate that they have a couple signs and symptoms or medical history concerns, then make them fill out the screening form. But when you have them fill out that screening form, just make sure you know that, that these things right here are gonna also play a role. Now, two of the screening forms that we went through, and we're not gonna talk about one of them, which is the Epworth today, but the Epworth is an evaluation to determine daytime sleepiness. Now, on that test, it asks you to evaluate the likelihood that you would fall asleep during such activities. You're gonna do a score of zero to four, zero to three, I'm sorry, and you're gonna write that score down and total it up. And at the bottom of that, it'll give you the levels of risk you are based on your score. So real quick, show of hands, who did that assessment yesterday? You got a bunch of y'all have your hands stuck up. So go ahead and make sure your hands are put down after a question. If you did your screening forms, please make sure to raise your hand. Okay, awesome. So I'm a, I thought a little bit more of you guys would do the screening forms, but that's okay. Thank you for participating. So the Epworth is an amazing one, daytime fatigue. The other one we're gonna to come to at the end of our intraoral signs, just for review, and that's gonna be your, our awake and asleep screener. We're gonna specifically talk about the last section on the awake and asleep screener, and it's a questionnaire. And on that questionnaire, it is an amazing tool to use in the hygiene chair, um, either before or after you get into the intraoral exam. We recommend before the intraoral exam, just so you have some more ammo. So we'll talk about this. And as we go forward, we want to really talk about the intraoral exam specifically, because these are things you're familiar with. And we're going to teach you a slightly different verbiage set for talking about them and different application in recognizing them. So real quick, as we get forward, before I go any further, I need you guys to, um, I need you guys to think of your three favorite things we're gonna go through right now. Now it sounds weird, I'm aware, but what are your three favorite things that are wrong with people that we're gonna discuss? Talk about intro signs, we had some a few seconds ago. I need you to find your three favorite, the things that you most connect to. We're gonna come back to this in just a few minutes here. Um, I have a couple people who are using the question and answer spot to um, ask for the forms. If I could have you guys do me a favor, in the chat box, message the panelists and send your email and we will try and get those sent out as soon as possible. Okay, this question and answers of questions, guys. Chat box is for chat. Um, if you have questions, please use the question answer chat function. Please don't use the chat for that. Also, please use the chat when I ask questions. Thank you, uh, Natalie, for sending in your email. Um, use the chat, I'm watching that chat. So when you guys actually send in messages or if I ask for your score, stuff like that, we are actually live. This is not like, I'm not a recorded person. Um, this is, Actually, I'm not going to tell you the date because I'm terrible at remembering dates, but you can um, make sure that you are chatting there in the back. Um, if you miss those forms, again, we're going to email you guys um, as soon as we can with those forms. Thank you. Thank you for jumping out. Okay. 
All right, going forward, so let's look at some intraoral signs. When we talk about intraoral signs, the biggest thing we want to look at is intraoral crowding. Do we see enlarged soft tissue structures? The biggest one I'm going to talk about here, because we'll talk about some of these in a few seconds here, but is the uvula. The uvula is actually, we're not born with long uvulas. We, we have pretty standard uvulas when we're, when we're born, and uvulas are elongated over time when we have a decrease in pressure. So this pressure in the throat actually pulls the uvula down over time and causes it to stretch. Real quick, show of hands from my doctors in the room, how, or hygienists, dental assistants, whoever you are, how many long uvulas, or who has seen a long uvula since you've been open, or if you, when you were open? Raise your hand. Yeah, there you go, thank you. So we've got a couple people with long uvulas. Now that is being caused by a decrease in pressure that's pulling down the uvula over time. Crazy. So when we look at that, that's going to be the big one um, from this. And just look at, think about the airway like a hose. If air can't pass through the hose because there's a kink in it, because soft tissue structures are crowding, then we can see that there's a high chance for an obstruction to occur. Okay, so intraoral crowding, can air pass through? Cool. Uh, Sandra, thanks for your question. We're going to come back to that. Um, great question. All right. So, Malin Patty. When it comes to the Malin Patty, the Malin Patty was designed by Dr. Malin Patty. Big surprise here. Um, Dr. Malin Patty was an anesthesiologist, and he actually built this sc uh, screening tool to evaluate if a patient is at risk to have an apnea or have their airway collapse while being put under anesthesia. Uh, I can't pronounce that word, so I'm just going to skip it. Uh, when being put down and put under. Here, what we're going to be looking at is the first two classes are considered to be not at risk or not very high risk, whereas classes three and four are considered moderate at risk. How do we determine? Now, there's a clinical verbiage. I'm going to teach you that, but when we talk to patients, we're just going to show you both real quick. The first more clinical one is we're going to be looking at the distance from the base of the tongue to the soft palate. Pretty simple. You guys can see that in class one, two, and three, we can see the, class, the space from the tongue to the soft palate actually reducing. In class four, we actually aren't probably seeing the soft palate at all. We're only looking at the hard palate. So we can see why that makes sense. For a patient, what I use to talk to patients, say, okay, well, stick out your tongue. And what we're going to look at is see if we can see space around the uvula. In class one, we can see all the way around the uvula. Class two, we can see a significant amount of space on either side of the uvula, but we cannot see just the end. Class three, we can barely see the size of the uvula because it's starting to disappear. In class four, we're only looking at the hard palate. So that's the way we talk to patients about this. And how you do this is you have the patient sit upright at least 45 degrees, have them stick their tongue out, and I'll demonstrate in just a moment here, and then take a picture with their phone or your intraoral camera. The tongue needs to come over the lips out all the way, okay? If your tongue is staying in the mouth and you're doing a malin patty, you're not getting an accurate representation of the size of the tongue because we're creating muscle tone and compressing the tongue into a confined space. So we're going to take the tongue out of the mouth, open up, and the last thing is do not say ah. Don't say ah. That's it. So sit up, tongue out, don't say ah, take a picture. It's going to look a little bit like this. I'm going to take my phone, for example. I'm going to turn on my flashlight. And I'm going to show you my mouth, okay? All right, so you can see I have no tonsils. I told you about that earlier. And since I've got a tonsillectomy, it's allowed my jaws to actually open up more. Um, and I actually was a class four, and now I'm a class two. So pretty kind of, kind of crazy anatomical change there. So here... When we look at the melon patty, it's in a great way to have a question. It's also a great opportunity for patients to share on social media. So let's go through a couple more intraoral signs and symptoms. All right. Um, by the way, Vesna, thanks for saying hi from San Diego. Um, San Diego is my favorite spot in the whole wide world. Um, I vacation. My, I do my mini vacations there. Um, it's the spe specifically Sunset Beach. So awesome. Um, Cool. So let's talk about some intraoral signs. What does it look like? What does apnea look like in the mouth? And how, how does this make sense? We're going to talk about the signs and we're going to talk about talking points in the mouth so that we know what's going on with the patients and how to communicate with them. Macroglossia. Now, if you say that to a patient you, and then you ask them to say, say it five times fast, they might struggle. Here, when we're talking to them, though, they're going to get lost on that clinical term. We know what it means in a large tongue. 
So here's the deal, guys. If the tongue is too large to fit in the mouth when we're awake with muscle tone, at night when that tongue expands, it's going to likely fall back and collapse the airway. So it's not indicative of an airway con concern. It's not going to be objectively proving that we have sleep apnea because we need a home sleep study to do that. But it is a very common sign of sleep apnea, and it can be indicative. It's not always indicative. So, hi, uh, Anna from Virginia. Oh, I saw you. I think you were here last time, too. Acid reflux. Now, I love acid reflux. Um, uh, sorry. I love acid reflux in this conversation because it's a really unique one. See, we see yelling on the tongue. So we're often kind of thinking that the patient probably was just really thinking about us before they came in for their teeth cleaning, right? So they went to Starbucks and they got that black coffee and that uh, muffin with the, the really thick icing on it. And that's what they did right before their teeth cleaning visit. So how do we know if a patient was just super considerate and thinking about you when they went to Starbucks this morning or if they have acid reflux? Pretty simple. What we're going to do is we're going to take an instrument, um, use a probe or one of the hooks, and use the, the non-pointing part of the hook. I'm sure you would have figured that out. Um, and lightly scrape the top of the tongue. If residue comes off, then you know that that patient was just thinking about you this morning. If residue comes off, then that means it's residue from food that they had eaten. If it is in fact stained, then that patient likely, um, sorry, that patient has sleep apnea. And the reason is, is because when we have apneic events, and you guys learned about this idea of Bernoulli's principle last week, where we talked about pressure being placed on the esophageal sphincter. When pressure is placed on this esophageal sphincter from an apneic event, it actually causes the valve to kind of degrade, to get weaker, to become more floppy. It allows acid to crawl up the airway and actually stain the tongue. The key word is stain. The, the tongue will be stained. If it comes off, that patient does not, that patient tongue staining is not a result of acid reflux. If this tongue is stained, you have an objective way to show them that they have acid reflux. One other side note, we heavily recommend warning the patient before you scrape the top of their tongue. That's completely your discretion though. So that, that's up to you. Some patients, maybe they like the surprise. Poke, I'm just kidding. Bad idea, don't listen to the idea. Please warn the patients. Lightly scrape the top of their tongue. If it comes off, remember, they were just thinking about you this morning. Hopefully, they also brought you Starbucks, right? Bruxism. A study done in Portugal showed that 70% of people who had Bruxism also had obstructive sleep apnea. Now, this is one study. That study also showed the patients who had apnea and were treated with a snore guard, I'm sorry, not a snore guard, a Bruxism guard, were actually had worsened apnea as a result of having that snore guard. Sorry. Snore guards are another topic, and I just get kind of, I'll talk about snore guards in a moment here, but bruxism guards in particular. The study showed 70% of people who had bruxism also had sleep apnea. When treated with a bruxism guard, those people had worsened apnea, 50% of them. 50% of the people who had, who had obstructive sleep apnea and bruxism had worsened apnea when they had an occlusal guard. So here's our recommendation from this slide. One, apnea and bruxism go hand in hand. We gotta figure out which one is primary and which one is secondary. If they're both primary, okay, cool. Then we need an appliance that treats both. If they don't have sleep apnea and they just have bruxism, then we can just treat the bruxism. Fantastic. But how does bruxism relate to sleep apnea? When our body has an apneic event, our brain yells to our body, wake up, forward march, and our jaw is gonna do this thing. When it does this, we're going to see wear and tear on the teeth because it's, as you can hear, it's causing an upward and forward motion. Sometimes that'll be in an angle, but you should see consistent wear and tear. Now, this patient probably needs a, a bruxism guard, but they may also have sleep apnea. So when we look at that, before you treat a patient with a bruxism guard, make sure you're using the right guard. We don't want to make their chronic life-threatening condition worse by treating them. And now you know. Our position is that if any dentist who sees this slide and hears me talk, or any of our coaches talk, they need to make sure that patient does not have sleep apnea before they treat them. Treat them with the right appliance. If they have sleep apnea and bruxism and both are primary, then you can get the dual rated appliance. A lot of the time though, if you treat a patient with an oral appliance, you're gonna resolve the bruxism because it's a result of a physical collapse. So, very important thing there. Um, hope you guys knew that. And if you don't, I'm happy to share it with you. If you've got anything from today, that's probably the most important. Scalp tongue. When we talk about scalp tongue, we're going to be looking at that same physiological response to a collapsed airway. The tongue is being flanned against the back of the teeth over time. For me, it was happening 22 times an hour. 
For some patients, it was happening 35 or 15. I saw one patient that it was happening 120 times an hour or two. That would leave some long-lasting impressions on the back of the teeth. This is a symptom that diagnosed my mother. So when you look at the scalp tongue, could be caused by that, again, that same physiological response to a collapse. Attrition. When we talk about attrition, um, obviously this person probably needs a good toothbrush as well as good sleep, but our body is not able to process chemicals the way that it's supposed to. We actually talk about this as part of the reason that patients may gain weight or have a hard time losing weight, in part because apnea stops them from processing the chemicals they need to the way they're supposed to. So um, attrition is a good sign. Again, this is a often, I mean, as my dental friends who do a lot of appliances say, I have found when I treated patients with apnea, the dental work that I do lasts a lot longer than when before when I wasn't treating apnea because there was additional corrosion occurring on the teeth and in the mouth. High vaulted hard palate. Now, high vaulted hard palate is a pretty big indicator, and here's why. Because when our tongue can't go up, it's going to go back. We know our tongue is going to expand when we go to sleep. We learned this last week. But when that tongue expands, where is it going to go? If it can't go up because the hard palate is not expanded enough, then it's going to fall back, therefore creating a greater likelihood that we're going to have an apneic event. Now, as it relates to high vaulted hard palate, there's a lot of things, orthodontics, surgery facilitated orthodontics, surgeries that can be done to expand the hard palate. And that's why one of the biggest things in kids in ortho is to actually give them enough space to allow their airway uh, possible in development. So basically, braces and orthodontics as kids is an amazing way to prevent sleep apnea uh, for those that are at risk. So high vaulted hard palates, um, if you're an ortho, fantastic. That might be a case for you. But if you're not, then it's a screening tool for you today. Tonsils. Now, these are not my tonsils, so no one freak out. But these are gross tonsils, that is for sure. Um, if you can see, real quick, hands up, who has patients that you see who have kissing tonsils? Kissing tonsils in the room? Yeah. So those are nasty. Now, tonsils are not always something that you can treat. Yeah, sorry, tonsils are 90% of the time not something you can treat unless you happen to also be an ENT. So some ENTs have DBS or DMD behind their name, and that's awesome. But tonsils are a really big indicator for sleep apnea. Now, we can remove them. I was a rare case. Most patients do not have the response I did to tonsillectomies. My tonsillectomy completely treated my apnea. Like, I went from 22 events an hour to less than, I think it was one. One event per hour was my average. Kind of crazy decrease for me. But still, tonsils can be a big indicator. Now, for me, I was treated with an oral appliance first. I went from getting tonsillitis every two and a half months to getting tonsillitis never. Like, once I got my oral appliance, I never had tonsillitis, and then I didn't have tonsils. So, Apparently, it's hard to get tonsillitis without tonsils. Um, Lena asked, what do you think about myofunctional therapy? We're going to get to that in a few minutes. Um, I'll take that in the question and answer side, but great question. So we're starting to get this picture here of what we see for the signs of obstructive sleep apnea. Real quick, I'm going to share a quick story. Um, of just in rela relation to my tonsils real quick, I need to, I need to know what your three, three favorite things we've discussed so far are. What are your three favorite? What is their medical history? They're from last week's the impact training, or if they're just into oral science, in the chat box, not the question box, the chat box, please sh comment your three favorite things. And I'm going to use one of your examples in our demonstration in just a few minutes here. So please make sure to comment those. I'm going to tell a quick story and why I get um, really riled up about Snorgards. So I am a sleep coach. I work for Awaken to Sleep, Awaken to Sleep and we... Real quick, you're all sharing, you're sharing one, so I need you guys to share three. So I see, Jennifer, you said bruxism. Thank you. What are your other two? Um, Elise, uh, intraoral signs. Awesome. Which three intraoral signs? Um, Kathy, Mal and Patty, fantastic. What are two more of your three favorites? Beth, intraoral. Give me, give me two or three specific things that you relate to. This is important. We need specific things. Awesome. Thank you, Natalie. Bruxism, scalp, tongue, and large uvula. Great. Okay, so back to my story. So I go in. I work for for waking to sleep. I've got a um, I've got a, a interpretation from the sleep physician. It says 
man, they've been our best advice. And I work with dentists. I know what this means. Go to the ENT, sit down, like, hey, I need my tonsils cut off. She's like, okay, cool. Why? I'm like, well, here's the paper. She's like, oh, that makes sense. Well, in case you don't want to go through an exorbitantly painful surgery, I can make you a snore guard. Have you guys ever had one of those moments where you thought you were dreaming and you were tempted to test it by just like reaching out and just, ah. and no, okay, that's just me. Well, I was, that was me in that moment. I was just like, you're joking. I just told you I teach dentists how to do this and you're going to offer me a snore guard. She was not allowed to say the words mandibular advancement device because she didn't have a DDS or DMD behind her name. A snore guard is an inappropriate device for a cause, for of someone who had the level of apnea that I have. Anyone who is a mild and above apnea needs to have a medical grade piece of equipment, not a snore guard, a boil and bite chair side thing that's gonna make me a silent apnea that's gonna make me harder to diagnose because I'm gonna be more adamant that I don't have a problem. Be careful. If someone is saying as an ENT or anyone who is saying, let's treat your apnea with a snore guard, absolutely not walk away from that conversation or correct them if you like them. But here's the deal. That is completely inappropriate. You will sometimes increase the level of apnea and you'll create what's called a silent apneic because they won't be snoring, but they're still having apneas. So now this patient's going to more assuredly actually have worsened apnea and decrease their lifespan and have a higher risk for all these. Co Don't. I was, I actually, no joke. I called them after I left and said, please take my, my, please exchange my records to this new office. I won't be working with your facility. And they were highly recommended by local uh, physicians here. So it was, that's my soapbox. I'm going to get off it now, but just know, um, thank you, Gilbert. You guys are, dentists are the only ones who are qualified to manufacture and maintain the care of oral plant therapy. You, you will hear me say that on repeat all the time because it's the most accurate thing you can say. Awesome. You guys rock. Thank you. Gary, Sharon, Marina, Sandra, Judith. Um, thank you. And the others I didn't list. Uh, a lot of you guys, some of you guys are doing all the attendees. Some of you are just doing panelists. So just so you know, I can see everything. So don't worry about it. When we talk about a combined view, we have our three favorite things now. We have, oh, Gilbert. Yep. That makes sense. Um, so when we have our three favorite things, we talk about our social impact. We talked a lot about that last week. If you missed that, go to Plan Methods YouTube channel. Check out our recording last week. Or if you need a couple minute review, we've got a bunch of free educational content on our YouTube channel too. Go check it out. It's free. No promo. Just watch our stuff, learn from it, use it, play it for your patients. We don't care. Here's the deal. Find three. Now, one last thing. This is part of the questionnaire on that Awaken and Sleep screener. I hope my team was able to send out some of those to you guys already. But if not, that's okay. We're going to cover this one in detail. Here's the deal. I'm going to leave this up for about a minute because we've got to get to our screening script. But what we're going to do here, I need you to answer the yes or no questions only. And if you say yes to a question, the answer is, sorry, the score is the number next to the question. So, for example, number one, have you ever been told that you stop breathing while you sleep? While sleep. Yes. You get eight points, not one. Eight. Now, if you are someone like me and you're like, well, yeah, but some, I, th that only happened once, but I had a couple drinks. And so I don't know if it counts. I'm going to repeat the question for you. Have you ever been told? Was there a, if yes, please explain why? No. Are excuses welcome on this questionnaire? No. That's why I love it so much. I kind of hate excuses in general. So when a patient doesn't have an opportunity to tell me an excuse and the answer is yes, great. Now you don't have to cut off the patient's excuse. But if the answer is yes, the answer is yes. Eight points. So what I want to know, please, uh, yes, we are going to email. If you've sent your email to the panelists, we will make sure these get to you guys later. No problem. It will either come from Awaken to Sleep or from um, Plan Mecca. We'll, we'll get you this. No problem. Here's the deal. Take a picture of this. I need you guys to post your score in the chat box real quick. Um, and then we're going to do some, some roll call. So get your scores. Eight points for Brandon. You healthy, sir. Healthy-ish. Cool. I was a 39, 39, come on. We need some unhealthy people to share their scores, please. Because Lena, Kerry, and Kathy, and Brandon are only moderate, low to moderate risk. Thank you. I was like, I know Mike's on the call. He's 43, Natalie, 18, Elizabeth, 42, Gary, 21. Awesome. Elizabeth, you almost got high score. 14, awesome. 39. 
Hey, Almira, we got the same score. Thank you. I'm sorry. It's okay, Elizabeth. We know. See, here's the deal. I got a frowny face in the comments here. That's okay. We're not sad. Here's why. This conversation we need to understand is an amazing place to start because it means that the things that are probably annoying you in your life, we have an answer for. We know where to go next. I want to talk about that in just a second here. Awesome. 32, 18, 21, 12. Fantastic. Keys, please comment. Keys continue your score. Here's the deal, guys. It's an amazing question. It's powerful. Even if you're moderately at risk. Real quick, show of hands. Who's interested in taking a home sleep study home now that you just did that questionnaire or maybe just some of the intro signs? Awesome. Awesome. Yes. We are past double. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you guys for participating. Here's the deal. We got a couple of yeses in the chat box too. This isn't, a, this doesn't have to be a terrible conversation. This is a, a life changing conversation. Okay. Real quick. We're going to jump into our protocol script in just a second. Um, and let's watch this video and give you guys a break and we'll, we'll get into our protocol in just a second here. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless and I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head it is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just, sometimes it's like, there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Yeah, I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on, Ow. if you would just- Don't! Try to see things my way. Do I have to keep on talking? All right, guys, so we share that video because one of the biggest life lessons I've learned, and it is <laughs> extremely valuable, I found out engagement, and I'm intending to use this in marriage as well, but um, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. Someone said that, I'm stealing it. I don't remember who said it, so I can't even tell you. I've heard from a couple guys that I think try to quote it as their own, but people don't care what you know until they know that you care. Our three favorite things, I'm going to scroll back in our chat in just a second here, are going to play a role in this conversation here because this conversation is around those three favorite things. I asked you to find your three favorite things so that you can start the conversation in a, from a place that you are passionate about, that you're excited about, that people can look at you. Like, there's no doubt in your mind that I love my job. I love what I do. I mean, that's the reality of it. So when you talk to people, can you come back, come across like me? Now, don't pretend to be me. That's, that's, that's a bad idea. But can you be you and also come across with passion and conviction and just a desire to help people? And can, can they hear that? And we're going to teach you the script, the protocol to help them understand that. Now, please understand, this is a script. It's a protocol that we developed to help you increase home sleep study effect, effectiveness. Here's the deal. This is an outline and a framework. I have helped practices implement this in ways that are different than I thought it would be built originally. Because your practice is unique. We are a company that believes there's not a, a, a sorry, there, there's not only one way to do sleep apnea. So when we talk about, thanks Gilbert, when we talk about this right here, this is an outline. If you get offended or you don't like something, then take it out, no problem. Okay, so no, that's, that's okay. But this is a protocol. This protocol successive, successfully implemented has actually increased home sleep study acceptance in practices that I've worked with by 200 and 300% in some cases. In the low end, 50%. They went from doing like four tests to six tests. But the offices that I've, I've worked through this a couple times with, 
and really honed in how it works in their system, those offices went from testing five to six people to 15, and some months 18. So kind of crazy, take notes. Um, for those that you, we will be sent, send a follow-up email with, this, with a written version of the script as well. So we'll make sure that gets out to you, don't worry. But take notes um, and then make sure you take your team through this training later. So what was gonna happen here, a couple things. Now, one, a disclaimer. I believe in disclaimers, I'm a very big fan of them. Um, I took one acting class in college and I was so memorable that the teacher failed me for not attending. I um, had a perfect attendance in college and my first semester I got a 4.2 GPA. So, yeah. So if I can do what I'm about to show you, you have no excuse. That's all I wanna say. So if I can do what I'm about to show you, just know that there's, your team can absolutely do this. There's gonna be a little bit of acting here. I encourage you guys role play this with your team. And we're gonna talk about a couple of things. Now, one other disclaimer, this involves multiple roles, okay? So we're gonna talk about the de dental assistant and hygienist. They're gonna be on this side. So if I'm on this side, I am Chad, the dental assistant hygienist. And if I'm on this side, I'm Dr. Smith. And then if I'm right here, I'm just talking to you. Or I may be portraying uh, Mrs. Jones, who's our patient today, okay? So that's the stage for you. One other thing, when I do this, that means that it's a break in the role playing. I'm gonna break down something, okay? So we talked about a couple, three favorite things here. And we um, got some scores, awesome. So let's go with, I'm gonna take, um, I'm gonna take Gary, Gary Friedman. He said Bruxism, Gerd, and Malin Patty, but I'm gonna change Malin Patty up just a little bit. I'm gonna take that one out. Um, because I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume that my hygienists really are mad at me because I wanna add more to their schedule. And so they didn't have time to do the mountain patty because it took three minutes and, and anyway. So hygienists, your time is valuable, not mocking that, but the reality is, well, let's just say we didn't get to the mountain patty. So bruxism, acid reflux, and as a hygienist, you guys have an opportunity as a, as a trusted advisor with your, with your patients. They see you more than most of their friends. They see you then, Sometimes their parents or their sisters or brothers or grandkids, whatever, they see you more frequently because they're in your, your chair every six months. So here, when we talk about this, you guys have an opportunity to speak in their lives from a position of care and friendship. So in, in my friendship as Chad the Hygienist, Mrs. Jones came in and she was sharing with me about how hard it's been lately that she just can't have the energy when she wakes up in the morning. She's just, she is almost late to work every day. She's almost late to her dental appointment because she couldn't get out of bed in the morning. So we're gonna take um, acid reflux, bruxism, and morning fatigue. So we're, we're in our chair. I've already have her health history. There's some concerns on there. I see some, I did a quick intraoral exam and I'm talking to the patient, right? So this is what happens. Look over the medical history, look at Mrs. Jones. Okay, quick intraoral exam. Hey, Mrs. Jones. Um, as you were talking, I actually kind of picked up on a couple of things. One, in, I'm noticing that you're actually grinding your teeth right now. You've got some teeth grinding going on. I know we talked about that in the past. Um, I'm also noticing that I think there's some acid reflux going on. Real quick, can I test this? Can you open your mouth real quick? I'm just gonna lightly scrape. Okay, yeah, that's, that's stained on there. So we can see there's some acid reflux going on. And you were just talking to me about how hard it is to, to get up in the morning. Um, I'm concerned. I'm concerned there's an airway issue, and I think you should take home a test. Pause. Hygienist on the call, doctor on the call, that's a hygiene conversation. You, hygienist, you're going to wait for, or dental assistants, you're going to wait for that patient to respond, first and foremost. One, real quick, who felt like I communicated from a position of care and not sales? Who thought I was coming? Raise your hand if, if you thought I was just sharing like i'm i'm concerned yeah awesome over one fourth of the call is is raising their hand right now thank you the rest of you you're either asleep or i'm wrong and that's i'm, I'm sometimes wrong and not often but it happens so that's that's what we're talking about we just came from a point of concern we didn't say sleep apnea because we don't know what's going on yet we're just concerned about their airway where we can see as a dental clinician the top of right so our airway health we're looking at that now what happens if the patient says no Nothing. Okay, 
Fantastic. Let's move on. Let's do our tooth cleaning. We're going to keep doing. If the patient says no, we will live. Okay? So, patient says no, we're going to look in here, do our cleaning, stuff like that. Now, typically in a doctor practice, what we're going to talk about is we're going to have um, the hygienist be there. The doctor is going to come into the operatory, and the hygienist is going to share the dental concerns with the doctor. Um, real quick, show of hands, where does that, whose practices does that happen in? The hygienist shares their concerns with the doctor, um, whether it be in front of or not. Okay, perfect. Awesome. There's a lot of you guys. So here, thank you, Elizabeth. Smooth transition. Yeah, so here, we're not going to change any of that. We're not going to change. Keep your dental conversation a dental conversation. The hygienist, you, you came to the patient. You were concerned. They said no. Okay, cool. If they said yes, we'll talk about that in a second here. But then the doctor comes in. You're going to review the dental signs with the doctor. So Dr. Smith comes in. Hey, Dr. Smith, so I was talking to Mrs. Jones. It looks like there's a cavity on number 17, maybe um, looking at some advanced gum treatments, and uh, number 45 doesn't exist. So that's all good. Cool. Doctor, you're going to do your stuff. You're going to be you, do your dental stuff. I'm not going to pretend to be a doctor. You're really good at that, so you do you. At the end of your dental exam, doctors, probably the most important part of the entire script right here, what you're going to do is you're going to look at the hygienist when you're done with your dental exam and you're going to say these words or something very, very similar. Chad, is there anything else we need to talk about? That's it. Doctor, that's all you say. You have to queue up. You have to queue up the doctor, the hygienist, into the next part of the script. Hygienist, this is where you come in. You're going to say the same exact three things you did earlier. Very important. The same three things. We said acid reflux. We said bruxism. And we said um, morning fatigue. And this is what we're going to do. Hygienist, you're going to look at the doctor. And you're going to do this. You know, Dr. Smith, um, I was talking to Mrs. Jones, and I was really concerned about her airway health because I started to see some signs such as bruxism and acid reflux, and she was also talking to me about how hard it is right now for her to be awake when she gets up, and, and I was really hoping you could comment to that. Hygiene, real quick, pause. You need to take that pause. I know it looks silly, goofy on the screen, but here's the deal. Who has kids in the room? Kids in the room, raise your hands. When you have kids in the room and they get in trouble, what is the most, I'm not a parent, so I, I get to say it's funny. When they're in trouble and you go like this, what happens? Sometimes they start apologizing for stuff they, you didn't even know they did, right? So the reality is that we're going to lower the temperature in the room by having what's called a pregnant pause. You can hold your breath. You can chew your lip. You can chew your cheek. Take a breath is my favorite. I take a, breath, a big breath through my nose. A pause for three seconds. Okay? So we do that. Doctor, you're, you're next. You're going to take your chart notes and you're going to look at the patient. You know, look at your notes and thumb through them real quick. I have the patient open up, look at the bruxism, look at the acid reflux, and this is what you're going to say. Mrs. Jones, patients who exhibit these signs and symptoms have two choices to evaluate if they have an airway concern. They can test in a hospital setting, or they can test in the comfort of their own home. What should you prefer? And then you wait. Real quick, raise a hand if you would rather test at your home. Raise a hand if you would rather test at your home. Now, thank you. Yes. Doctors, real quick. Some, I get Doctors, you care about patients so much that you don't want to give them two choices, but here's the reality of it. There are only two choices to rule out the presence of an airway concern. Only two. This isn't a sales trick. There are only two ways to do this, a home sleep study or a polysomnogram. That's it. Those are the patient's choices. They will likely choose one, and if they choose polysomnogram, then you need to write them a referral to an in-lab testing center. And when they don't do it in six months, you can bring up the conversation again because it's gonna, they're going to start being more conscious to it. Now, additionally, if they say yes to a home sleep study, then you just go into your home sleep testing protocol. Whether you own and operate your equipment, you can send it out. Or you can use a third party like Awaken Sleep or many others that will ship directly to your patient. So just understand that I'm not going to talk about our services unless specifically asked because we don't want to come off selling that. But there's ways to test. 
Now, if the patient says no, no problem. Just mark it in your notes that they refused when you recommended that option and move on. And in six months from now, when their symptoms or their struggles get a little bit worse, then you can start the conversation again in a more casual way. So let's recap real quick. Hygienist, you're going to take the form and information from front office that they've done for you. They are going, to, you're going to look over the stuff, you're going to do a quick intraoral exam, and you're going to share, if you, if you believe there's an issue, you're going to share your three favorite things, the things that you think that you most connect to that communicate your passion and say, I'm concerned, and I think you should take home a test. Then, if the patient says no, no problem. The doctor, when the doctor comes in, you're going to do your dental exam. Doctor, you're going to cue the, the, the hygienist by saying, is there anything else we need to talk about? Hygiene. Pregnant pause. Share your three favorite things to the doctor. And then, wait. Doctor, physically review paperwork. I know it seems silly, but do it. If you don't print stuff, at least have a screening form that's printed out. Physically review your paper. Look at that and give the patient their options. If the patient says yes the first time the hygienist asks, hygienist asks, then hygiene that you're doing the same thing. Doctor, you're still going to ask, is there anything else? Hygienist, you're going to say, yeah, Mrs. Jones and I talked earlier, and she's actually going to take on the home sleep study. Really excited about this. Just encourage her. Okay? That's it. Pretty simple, really easy, relatable. Um, and the reality is people don't care what you know until they know that you care. So um, Gilbert, my protocol, I refer to a pulmonologist to start and start there, Chatterman Humble. Yeah, that is a protocol you can use, but patients say no, patients don't get through processes when complexity is involved. So if you can own and operate your own equipment or use a part, service to take care of it there, then that'll actually also work. But that's, that, that is an acceptable protocol, 100%. Depends on the level you want to be involved. So that is our protocol. And I'm going to share my screen real quick, but that's actually it for today. That is our screening training. We went through as much as we could in one hour, and there is, a, I actually believe there's a recording of this already up, so you guys can see that up on PlanMeca's site. And, um, and that, is, um, that is it. So let's get into questions and answers. Um, if you guys need me to, again, um, I believe in about two minutes, they're gonna be sharing a link with you so you guys can get your certificates. But if there's question and answers, or you guys want me to review any part of that protocol, please let me know. So, okay, uh, yeah. I see a couple different, oh. Hi, Chad. Um, I, hey, uh, yep, I just wanted to go over some questions that have come in. They were over in the chat side and we got them over to the Q&A. And so we have um, a few questions for you. Uh, the first one is, and you may have answered some of these, um, so um, if you have, I apologize. But um, so does bruxism occur because you have an apneic event, then your body wakes up and the mandible slides forward, grinding against the teeth is the question. Yes. So basically what's, what's happening, remember from our day one, our body falls into the state called atonia. We call it a tonic state here to wake and to sleep where our, our, our muscles, our skeletal muscles in particular fall asleep. So they expand and we lose muscle tone and that can cause a collapse in the airway. So our body, you know, when it wakes us up using adrenaline and other hormones, it actually causes the body to just wake up and, and, and gaining muscle tone and trying to open up the airway Often, not always, often we will see bruxism occurs because the mandible is moving forward and up and sometimes to the side. That can cause bruxism because you, your body's not, you're not conscious, like it's more subconscious than conscious. You are in a conscious state of mind technically, but you're not, you're not meaning to. So your teeth are grinding in that instance. So yeah, great question. Um, and they did just share the link for the CEs if you guys want to go do that survey. So, and the course code is 200. All right. Thank you, Chad, on that uh, question. The next one is, um, instead of the hygienist suggesting sleep study, shouldn't we discuss the possibility of sleep apnea and suggest a medical screening? Interesting. Um, so... I just want to make sure I understand the question properly. So what 
if Anna Marie uh, is on right now, could you kind of give me an example of a medical screening? Um, home sleep studies are a diagnostic tool, a medically diagnostic tool that should be interpreted um, should be interpreted by a board certified sleep physician. Um, I know that there are people out there that say you should use it for screening, and that's, in my opinion, isn't exactly appropriate. Uh, please hear me on this. Um, as it relates to reading sleep studies, as a dentist, it's not within your license. So don't get caught practicing without a license for that particular test. It's a medically diagnostic test that should be read by a medical doctor or a board-certified sleep physician. So that that's kind of where I'm concerned that we're going with that. Um, it's not inappropriate for a dentist or a hygienist to be suggesting a home sleep study because that would kind of be like suggesting that there's, there needs to be a filling or anything like that. Your scope of practice as a hygienist or a dental professional is in the mouth. So basically, we're looking at the top of the airway, and we're not diagnosing based on this medical diagnostic study, but we're referring for further testing. It's kind of like when I, when I go to the chiropractor and I have knee problems, and he says, well, you know what? I, I may be mostly a bone guy, but you should probably get an MRI to evaluate all the soft tissue structures as well. That's not inappropriate. That's something that relates to what he's doing. The intraoral signs and things of that nature that you're working with relate to apnea on a high level. And so it's not appropriate to ask that. And I would say and that can work. Don't get me wrong. Medical screenings or further screening or pulse oximetry or whatever you want to do, that is a valid, valid uses for valid ways to screen patients to a more further degree, but why are we going to add more steps to a process? Why can't we just do an already minimally invasive test that's a home sleep study that is approved by the FDA to be administered to a patient to diagnose obstructive sleep apnea, and if it's read by a physician, it, you're able to do as a dentist because you're just providing the test and the diagnosis coming from that person who's specialized. That seems like a simpler process and one that reduces costs for the practice and the patient because they're only paying one fee for a test, not these fees and having to come back six times. So it's not wrong, it's just different. There's not one way to do sleep. So I'm, don't hear me say that. Those are just my views as, it, my personal views as a sleep coach. And Chad, we have a question here. Um, it says, do we claim medical or dental insurance for the services and appliance? And then what are the codes? I'm not sure if you can uh, provide those in this forum, if those are provided in another forum. But um, that was the question is, is um, can we claim medical or dental insurance for the services and appliances? Yep. Uh, so no, sorry. <laughs> dental insurance will never cover oral appliance therapy or home sleep study because those are medical technology, medical devices. So a mandibular advancement device is not going to work for dental treatments. Now, it could kind of sort of work as a retainer, I suppose. But um, when we look at that, it is, it's going to be covered by medical insurance sometimes. Now, personally, medical insurance should be a bonus on a bailout. So if you guys want to bill to medical and the patient wants you to, then bill is a courtesy. We're going to talk about medical billing in the business of sleep next week with our CEO, Michael Cohen. So be here next week. But same time, same place. But the reality is that medical billing is going to complicate your process. So if you want to help your patient, there's ways to help your patient submit to their medical insurance, but only medical will cover it and only if you do the right steps. Oh, sorry, codes. So uh, a home sleep study, there's three codes. I'm going to tell you two of them because I don't remember the third one. Uh, 95806 and 95805, I believe they are, uh, depending on the home sleep study you're using. And then the code for an oral appliance uh, mandibular advancement device is E0486. Wonderful. And uh, we can comment those codes in the chat box as well. All right, thank you. Um, so how, one of the questions is, is, so how do we actually help them to do this at home? So they're- uh, Yeah. Go ahead. So we recommend a um, concierge service where you actually meet them at about nine, th I'm just kidding, don't go to their home. That's super weird. Don't do that, that was a joke. Sorry, I got dry humor in my tone, I'm monotone. So yeah, don't, don't do that. Here's what you do. You have a simple instruction sheet. I don't have a, a copy on me right now. A very simple instruction sheet. There's YouTube videos, depending on the unit that you're using. And you just have that patient wear it at home. And if you're using a third party service, then they'll handle all that stuff for you. They should anyways. Um, if, 
if they don't do that, then there's YouTube videos, but there should be t written instructions as well as YouTube video. If there's not one, then you can make one for your home sleep study. I recommend that actually, because then you can direct the patient to your website, which is going to be helpful for a lot of marketing purposes as well. So make a video of how to put on the unit and all that stuff on YouTube, use your cell phone, put it on YouTube, embed it on your website, best way to go. But there's also videos for most units already up there. So, awesome. um, Another question here. Uh, we have more questions that keep coming in. If you don't mind, Chad, are you able to stay with us longer? No, I'm, I'm good. This is, I'm cleared for a while. So as long as you guys have got time, do you want, I, I can see the questions, Brent, if you want me to just go through them too. That's fine. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Uh, so Sandra, you said we actually had a consent form to decline questions and an alert in a patient chart alerting us to uh, decline. If I told the dentist patient decline and doctor would not try to discuss with patient from his side, so it would just fade out. How do you discuss with your boss on how to be more assertive or persistent? Otherwise, patients go left undiagnosed if they did have it. Amazing question. Oh, my gosh. Who, Sandra, you rock, first and foremost. Thank you. Um, so the reality is that you just need to tell them, hey, I, I'm learning more about this, and I'm really passionate, and I really want to make sure that we're talking to patients about this. If they decline the sleep form, then can we ask them about why? Because they probably think that they know best. And if you, you can still use this script and say, we don't need a sleep form to have this conversation. And to someone else's question, we'll get to in a second about not avoiding the word sleep apnea. Yes, we can talk about airway health, right? So we, when we talk about this, you can say, can we try a different way? Even if they decline the sleep form, that's okay. Can we try to just have a conversation about airway? And here's the deal. It would be best to actually ask them the question, especially if they decline the sleep form. Because well, as you guys know, patients always have excuses that are never sick, right? So here, when we look about that, um, just make sure that you bring it up to your doctor, come from a point of, I really want to help patients, and you can at least start this conversation even if the doctor's not supporting you. Um, and that's going to be a little bit tougher, but I would say I would like to try this, and maybe you offer to spearhead the program. You teach your team, if you, or go to this webinar, have your team watch this, but I would say just ask him and show him a new way of doing things and say, it'll help us make more money. It'll help more people. And this is how we do it. You come for the, help him win and he'll be on your side. Um, I know a, uh, sorry, Elizabeth, you said, um, so should we avoid saying you might have apnea? Yes. In my opinion, you should. And here's why. In 2013, I read an article that said, you don't have sleep apnea if. Um, so apnea in my mind triggered a word. When I went to the doctor, he said, do you have sleep apnea? And I said, no, I mean, that, that's not a comprehensive screening, but apnea is a trigger word. It triggers a self-diagnosis. So we're going to say airway health because airway communicates importance of the concept. Great question. Sandra, again, I know clinic sleep test is more extensive than home sleep study. Which one is better? Or how do you present, how do you present the differences? Um, so great, great question. Man, you guys are solid. Thank you so much. If you're still here, you rock. Also, those were earlier. Thank you. Amazing questions. Um, so here's the deal, guys. Home sleep studies are required to be at least 90% lead to lead accurate for FDA approval. Most units are between 94 and 96% accurate lead to lead. So yes, in lab studies are more accurate because we have someone who's physically watching you. They're going to come in and they're going to put this stuff back on if it falls off. They're going to be scoring things manually while they're watching this test. It is more comprehensive and more accurate, but the home sleep study scope the specific scope of the home sleep study is to diagnose the presence, diagnose and detect the presence of obstructive sleep apnea. That's all it does. So it will also tell us, it will also tell us when um, there is central apnea going on, not what kind of central apnea. A, a polysomnogram is poly, it's many inputs, and it's to detect for any sleep disorder. So it's more comprehensive, but what are we looking at? If we're seeing signs in the mouth, like we just discussed, about obstruction, about our body reacting to a physical obstruction, hormones being released, teeth grinding, tongue scalloping, things of that nature, then that, those are signs of a, a likely obstructive condition, right? So my point earlier is, um, is that we want to make sure that we're testing for the right thing. Keep it simple. And the test will often tell us that there needs to be more testing done. Okay? Awesome. Um, 
Is there a difference between apnea and OSA? Super simple. Um, obstructive sleep apnea is one type of apnea. There's also central apnea, which is neurological disorders, and there's over 90 plus neurological disorders that could be wrong for the patient. Uh, I say apnea to, to hyphenate my text, but OSA, obstructive sleep apnea, is specifically what we are talking about today. Um, Elmira, what do you recommend for dry mouth results from opening mouth using CPAP? Um, great question. And for that question, as it relates to dry mouth and opening CPAP, um, I'm going to actually ask one of our panelists to message the answer that best. He actually has experience using a CPAP and is a sleep technician. So he's going to answer that as best as possible. Um, but there are various ways to do that. One thing, if you want to help do combo therapy with an appliance and a CPAP, that might help a little bit. Um, and I'm not, I'm not actually sure. That's a great question. I'm just going to, I'm going to do, I will, I will get back to you because I'm not going to try and pretend to know an answer I don't know. So that's a great question. Thank you for asking. And Lena asked, what is the best appliance? Um, man, what a loaded question. I love that question. Um, there's not a single best appliance. Um, if anyone tells you that, then they, actually, I'm just going to stop myself right there. If anyone tells you that, then they are uninformed because various patients with various dentitions require particular appliances. I have all my teeth. So for me, my options are almost limitless. I also don't have gum disease or anything like that. So for me, the reality is that I was able to choose the appliance I wanted. For me, the best appliance was the one that I wear. For all patients, this is, this is, if you want to, to your question, the, the best appliance is the one that a patient wears. That's it. That's the best appliance. Now, if we're talking about best results, that varies. Again, dentition is a consideration. The, the history and the severity of the patient, the, the TMJ considerations, myofunctional therapy is a consideration. What protocol you use to get your appliance is a consideration. If you have the right software suite, then you can get this amazing appliance that's out there that's super slim and easy. If, if you do analog appliances, then, there is, then there's other appliances out there. If you have a patient with dentures, there's, are, there are ways, to, it's difficult, but there are ways to make appliances for those patients. That, that patient who has, is a dentalist cannot wear the appliance that I use. It's just not possible. So that's a question that we will educate on the pros and cons of various appliances. We don't manufacture appliances, so we have no, um, well, we don't make any money or, or have any reason to endorse a particular appliance over another, right? So for us, we're going to educate on the types of appliances and where they fit in your practice and help you decide what one you prefer. And to go Dr. Gilbert's point, uh, holistic diagnosis is key and take it from there. So figure out what's going on with the patient, both medically and dentally. And then combine that to create a treatment plan for their airway based on the physician's recommendation. At that point, you as a dentist are the only one who are qualified to determine which appliance is best for that individual patient. So, hey guys, um, no cookbook. I think what you mean is there, don't give me the one, two, three, how to do this because I'm a unique practitioner and my practice is different from some of the others. So that's what I'm getting. Um, you guys were awesome today. Thank you. Oh, we had another question. When can we expect forms to be emailed? Um, I'm going to get with my team. We're going to get the, the list of attendees, and we will blast that out to you guys in the next couple of days. Um, having them, oh, another question. Does sleep apnea implants change bite or cause TMJ problems? Uh, it can. Um, dentists who treat this regularly, um, they actually tell me that less than 10% of their patients present bite changes or TMJ issues. Uh, that being said, there are ways to manage that. And that includes myofunctional therapy, again. Um, and other considerations. Join us next week for our Business of Sleep with Michael Cohen and how to use this education to go to the next step. Um, I had a great time with you guys. Check us out on YouTube. Follow us on social media. We'd love to be in contact with you guys as well. Thank you, Chad. You guys rock. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a great day.